This is Squash Alchemy. I'm Lisa Camilleri, and my guest today is Daryl Selby from Colchester, England. Daryl, you have represented England in the 2011, 2013, 2015, 2017, and 2019 World Team Championships, um, to which England came first in the 2013 and runners up in 2011 and 2017. You have represented England in the 2010, 2014 and 2018 Commonwealth Games, and you won a bronze medal in the 2014 men's doubles and a silver medal in the 2018 men's doubles. You are a British national squash champion, winning in 2011. You are a winner of 13 PSA titles. Your highest world ranking is number nine. You are currently ranked number six in the world. You're a husband and a father to three beautiful children, two boys and a girl. So congratulations on all your achievements so far and welcome and thank you for joining me at Squash Alchemy. No worries. Pleasure. Thanks for the uh, very, very nice introduction. Yeah, no problem. Um, I guess a question I sort of kick it off with is how did you play, how did you start playing squash? What age and why squash? Um, I started when I was about four or five. Um, my dad was a keen amateur player so he he picked the game up probably in his late teens early 20s um fell in love with it straight away uh, he was a football sort of keen footballer before and then squash was uh, was a really popular sport um obviously set in the 70s 80s especially over here there was a lot of clubs and the game was growing massively so a couple of his friends started playing and he started playing as well and then, yeah, had had me. I'm I'm the oldest of three, so I've got a younger sister and a younger brother. Um, so, um, I guess as it got busier at home, and I got older. Once I got to sort of five years old, obviously that's that's an easier age for for a father to manage. And uh, yeah, it took me down the squash club, um, out the way of of home. So my younger brother is five years younger than me so it probably coincided that when the third one came and my mum was at home busy with with my younger brother and sister like dad would she you know get rid of one of them and uh dad would take me down to the squash club and yeah give me a little racket and i just don't obviously remember too much of it that from that age but from um yeah from probably like seven or eight years old i've got good memories of of being at the club a lot of the time and uh yeah jumping on court a lot yeah, nice. So when did you um, sort of start getting private lessons and, you know, a little bit of training started happening? What age was that? I think, um, yeah, so when I started taking a little bit more seriously and getting lessons and joining in and stuff, I think I was around that sort of age of like seven or eight where I I wanted to do more than just muck around on the court with, with a couple of other people. So I had junior sessions on Saturdays at the club. And I would just join in with the junior sessions and obviously like just sort of progressed through the beginner group quite quick and you know, like try trying to play with older kids. Um, dad would actually just get on and give me lessons. And then I think once I got to about nine years old, I started having a couple of like one one lesson a week with a proper coach uh, from a different club. Um, and yeah, a guy called Nick Drysdale started started me started coaching me and yeah, from then I sort of took it a little bit more seriously. Um, I think when I was oh, when I was nine, actually, I got into the England under tens squad, and I think at that point, obviously, when you're that age, there wasn't loads of tournaments, but every tournament, uh, especially in, in sort of the south of of England, um, yeah. So that I think that's sort oh, he's actually quite must be quite good at this. He doesn't really lose many and. Uh, England England squad have picked him for for sort of a training session. So um, yeah, I better get in some proper lessons now. And yeah, uh, yeah so I started getting in proper lessons then. Yeah, cool. That would be now a pretty good cool thing being selected for England at such a young age. Yeah, I mean it's strange. In in the old days, they like I remember being being nine years old. James Wilstrop, similar age to me, and he was eight years old. And he was eight years old and we were at a national squad and we, we, we stayed away from, from home, like away from parents. That was my first time staying away and I was only nine. And that's to me now seems like quite a young age to have been left overnight in the care of other people. I mean, 
it was absolutely fine at the time, but I remember sort of being quite scared being in a hotel room at National Squad um, at that age. And I remember James like being really upset about being left on his own yeah. um, at that age, but you know, toughened us up. I think each age group you had the National Squads and National Training. I think for us we had like European Championships as a, as an age group, and I think the first ones first ones I had was under 16 I think um, now obviously the age groups have changed so they're obviously under 15 under 17 under 19 and in the old days under 16 under 19 I think the first ones I had was oh, maybe under 14s and under 16s I can't remember it's such a long time ago but yeah. Um, yeah got good memories of under 19 under 19 stuff with England we um, we won the world junior uh, championships in Milan um, I think we played against the Aussie guys. Pilly was playing for for the Aussies uh, then. He's the same age as me. Um, and a few others, Simon Carruthers, I think, was another one. And Matt Sanders, I think, was another one. I don't know. You probably know those those guys. Um, they didn't they didn't turn turn pro for very long or or that much. But um, yeah, that was that was very good memories for me as juniors, like under nineteen. Uh, world team champs. We had James Wilstrop, myself, and Phil Barker, Pete's uh, Pete's older brother in in the team, and we beat Egypt in the final, which is uh, yeah, good junior memories for me. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, and then you turned, you joined PSA in 1999, but then I saw it said you turned pro in 2004. Can you tell, you know, you explain to our audience what the difference is from joining PSA to turning pro? Yeah, so when I was, what was I, yeah, 16 or 17, well, I would have been in 99. So I think my dad made me join PSA, um, as in still the same now with PSA. Like if you want to join, you literally just pay the membership fee and you can put your name on the list, even if you played no tournaments. So um, I joined PSA just in case I was going to go pro the next year to try and get some points on the board which was like a little British circuit event got like 1.5 points or something and then uh, yeah then I, I decided I changed my plans and decided to go to university anyway so I joined PSA in 99 for, for like literally one I think six months or a year played one tournament maybe two and then um, yeah and then went to university from 2001 to 2004 and then, yeah, when I finished uni, that's when I that's when I turned pro. When you um, finished university and then decided, all right, um, obviously want to play squash, was was that a hard decision to make? Yeah, uh, it was. A, I think it was a decision of I've been study studying. I wasn't really studying that hard to be honest. I was playing a lot of football. I was socialising a lot, not playing much, much squash, and I got to a point where I was like, right. And coming to the end of this, I need to start doing something more seriously. Um, and I looked at my peers and the guys that I used to play with in juniors, um, just sort of kept an eye on on the tour. And the likes of James Wilstrop, as I said before, Greg Gaultier was my age, Pete Barr. Um, they were doing like really, really well already on the tour. Um, and knowing that I was there or thereabouts with them, as a junior, um, I guess gave me an incentive to be like, yeah, let's, let's give this a go. Let's get back, you know, into training and playing squash a little bit. So the last three, four months of, of university, I was obviously studying for my last exam. So I took that as a time to sort of socialize a lot less and use it as a time to start like getting my brain in gear for, for getting ready to, to, play squash so I didn't want to get a proper job at that age 21 I was like right if I want to get a proper job I'm going to extend my holiday um, and play squash but it, it, to be honest it gave me the chance to travel I wanted to travel a little bit um, and you know straight away I, I went to New Zealand for my first first three PSA tournaments um, and that was a great trip I was away for three weeks and um, had, a, had a great time probably definitely socialised too much but um learned a lot and and yeah after that trip realized that you know that's what I wanted to do um really enjoyed it enjoyed the challenge like did quite well got to semi-final my first tournament 
in a massive like 32 draw and had to play qualifying as well I think I played like five matches in three days and then those days it was like to 15 as well yeah. um so bit a bit of a grind uh sealed floors concrete floors and yeah I was I was struggling for the next two weeks it was a shock to the system like senior squash but um yeah learned a lot and yeah took, yeah. took it from there and haven't really looked haven't really looked back yeah awesome um you said that New Zealand was your first trip. That's a long way from home. And how did you, did you travel on your own or did you have others coming with you? I think I traveled with one other, another English guy, uh, a guy called Pete Bilson, who, um, who was from Manchester, who was uh, turning pro at the same time as me. Um, yeah, we went together, traveled together. I think we played all the same tournaments, stayed in the same place, met a couple of Irish guys out there. Uh, Niall Rooney and Arthur Gaskin uh, and they they sort of stayed with us for the rest of the road trip um, but in those days that was the only way you could get into tournaments to be honest like there wasn't a lot of options in in terms of just getting put in, you know starting at the bottom of the list every tournament you entered you, you know you'd end up on the reserve list and uh, the good thing about the New Zealand tour was it was in the summer so it was like July, June, well, July and August, which for most season pros is their off season. Um, obviously, down under that's uh, that's like height of of uh, prime squash season. So um, yeah, it was it was good to good to just travel over and uh, experience. We're talking a bit about you know physicality. Um, how has your training differed from you know your early twenties and to your early thirties, and now into your late thirties? Um, yeah, it's it's actually changed a lot. Like um, in my twenties, I've honestly felt invincible in terms of um, what you could put your body through in terms of a training training session, and then wake up the next day and do exactly the same again. Um, you know, you could do. I used to do sessions of four hundreds um, as like an afternoon session, and I'd be doing like sixteen or eighteen sets, and I would have already trained in the morning as well. And to think back then, being like 26, 27 years old, and doing that, like, if I did that now, I'd, yeah, I'd genuinely need, like, a day or two to recover just yeah. from that one session. Whereas back then, I'd probably done, you know, a court session in the morning and then done that in the afternoon and then gone again the next morning. So I think it's just the recovery is, is a major, major thing where you can really push your body hard um, as long as you're doing the right things, eating correctly, sleeping a lot, and in you know in those days before before having kids, you know it's not a problem. I was I was sleeping like nine ten hours a night, no problem because you know when you're putting your body under that much strain and stress, it needs to recover. Um, you know, as you know, when you have kids, you, you, you sort of let, miss that sleep. Um, your body your body gets used to it amazingly well. Like that's something I, I can't believe. Like, I, I can easily survive on six seven hours decent sleep now and in those days there's absolutely no I, I was like a zombie if i had six or seven hours sleep then so it's amazing how your body adapts to it but at the same time <coughs> as you get older it's very difficult to put your body through those really hard physical sessions like i want to but i know the damage that it can cause because it's just so hard to recover from so i think you definitely have to train smarter as you get older, you have to do a little bit more strength and conditioning, uh, making sure that, you know, if you do have a niggle or you feel like something's a little bit weak, really concentrate on that area and just do two or three strength sessions if your back feels weak or your glutes are not quite far in, whatever it might be, to really just, just do a couple of sessions on it, strengthen it up, get that confidence back and not sort of worry too much about all those you know, it, it, in your 20s, you're trying to improve your level, improve your fitness, all that type of stuff. Whereas I think you, you I know now I, I really can't get anywhere. I can't physically peak past where I've already been. So I'm having to try and um, increase and get better in other areas. And I think that's where my squash has improved, really. Like my squash has continued improving because that's the one area I feel like you can, you, you should be able to improve, like whether it's your technique or your tactics, the more experience you have. There's no reason you can't sort of play smarter as well. Mm. You know, once you made it to the top 10, did things become a lot financially easier? Uh, no. The top 10 was, was something that I was very proud of achieving because when I left university, that was, that was my goal. 
So, you know, I said to my dad, I said, I want to, my goal for, for turning pro in the squad because he was, he was helping me financially with the first part of my fights for the first two or three years, which I'm always, you know, eternally grateful for. But, um, you know, and I said to him at the time, like, my, my goal is to get to become one of the top 10 players in the world. So when I, when I achieved it, I was really, really happy. And, um, I would have liked to have to stay there a bit longer, but <coughs> in, um, in those days, and still a little bit now, to be honest, it was always, the top eight were always seeded. And it was always very hard to break into that eight because they were protected in terms of the, the seedings. Um, so we changed the seedings from being like one to 16 to then being just one to eight and everyone else sort of going a little bit more random. And um, yeah, I just never, never got, never got to break into uh, the top eight. I think I had, had a chance at the British Open in, uh, I can't remember what year it was, maybe 2010 or 2011. If I'd done, if I'd maybe won one round or two rounds, and I think I drew Rami in the first round, um, and or I lost, unfortunately, but it was close, close three ones to Rami, and he was number one in the world at the time, I think, or number two. So, you know, you just, I think you need a little bit of luck to get into that top eight. And then once you got into that top eight, it was a little bit easier to stay in there. So, um, yeah, I don't think financially obviously like with with sponsorships and stuff it's probably you get a little bit more money and you get a little bit more um in terms of bonuses and stuff for being in the top 10 depending on what contracts you got but um prize money wise probably a little bit better as well but it's not it's not huge amounts to be honest um you can demand a little bit more for league matches i guess um again it's it's, it's like five it's like 10 20 percent but it, you know it's not it's still squash. It's not life changing money. It's just, um, it's just, you know, you feel lucky to, um, to do something that you enjoy doing and, and get paid for it. Like, um, there's lots of people that don't, don't enjoy what they do. Mm-hmm. So, um, to be able to travel and, and, uh, and get paid for it and have done for 15, 16, 17 years is a, is a nice thing. Very nice thing. Yeah. It's a pretty good lifestyle. And say, so, you know, like lockdown like this, being stuck at home and doing, you know, not, not earning, uh, not earning money at home at the moment makes you appreciate those those things you know so um yeah i appreciate it a little bit more now looking back on it yeah for sure um obviously being a dad to three kids how do you manage being a dad and being on pro tour is it tough being away yeah it's um yeah it's got tougher definitely got tougher um the addition of of another each little one's probably made it tougher as well for for my wife obviously when i left uh to go and play and there was just one you know it's easy she just had just had another which is my oldest to concentrate on but um now there's three of the, the little hoodlums running around it's um it's a lot tougher to leave them to be honest um but yeah again like i said about the sleep sort of factor you um you adapt um i've, I've adapted everything adapted the way i train and you know i don't train anywhere near as much as i used to i just i just can't i don't have the time I've adapted my recovery because you don't sleep as much and you, you know, you just, um, you learn ways that work, um, and and stuff that doesn't. So yeah, it's, um, you know, you just wouldn't change it. You wouldn't change it for the world. But, um, yeah, the last, last seven years, seven and a half years of, of playing, I've, I've been a dad, which, you know, that's, uh, coming up for almost half my career probably 40% of my career I've been a father for playing, which you know, it hasn't affected my, my results, which is a, you know, a positive thing, I think. And if anything, it makes you, um, it makes you realize that a loss, a bad loss, something like that, you know, it's not the end of the world. It, it, when you, when you're a bit younger, you know, it can mean everything and it, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with, with wanting to win so much and, uh, and you know you being genuinely upset afterwards but as you get older and gain more experience and, and have kids you, you realize that there's more to life than than um than a squash match not not to say that <coughs> not to say that you shouldn't give 100 percent when you're playing and try your best to win because that's something i always do anytime i step on court i always i always pride myself in, in trying to give 100 percent, and that's something that I'll, I'll always teach my kids and I always want them to see is that no matter if you're matchable down, if you're, if you're way down, 
playing someone who you think is way better, you have to try and get every single ball back. And that's, um, you know, at the academy here, that's something I always teach the kids. There's one thing that you, you can't, you know, there's, there's no excuse for not trying your absolute best. You, you know, you can say afterwards, the other, the other player was, was too good. Um, she, she hit the ball too hard and her, her shots were too good. Whatever that might be, that's, that's absolutely fine. But there's no reason for sort of not running and train best and that and you have to do that yourself um if you're gonna if you're gonna sort of uh tell everyone else to do it so um uh yeah um so what's next for for daryl so what, obviously when the tour um starts again and uh yeah what, what's next for the next year or so yeah i mean it depends when when we get going again it's it's a bit of a worrying time i think um i saw something today about the UK might be um, quarantining anyone that comes in, which obviously for squashes is not great. If if international travel is affected in in quite a bad way, um, I know I know you know Jen quite well, and Jen obviously when she came back to uh, Oz had to had to stay stay at home for fourteen days. It's um it's a tough it's a tough thing if that's going to be the case going forward for people. So um, yeah, I, I hope. Hope to be able to play a few more tournaments if if it carries on dragging on too long and unable to play. I mean, I still like to play a few more tournaments, but it's getting tough. I'm 38 later this year, so it's it's sort of getting to that point of I'm actually a bit bit too old to to carry on doing it, but, which is a shame. But um, I've got I've got a sports management business um, which um, I enjoy. Like as I said before, I enjoy trying to help and look after younger athletes and try and point them in the right direction and help them with as much as I can, mm. whether it's on the court or, you know, mainly, mainly away from the court, um, trying to help them in anything, any way, shape or form I can. So, um, yeah, I'm going to try and branch it out into, into other sports. I'm a little bit, you know, delve into a few other sports as well, not just squash. So, um, yeah, see, trying to, ex- Expand that, see how that goes. But um, it's just uncertain times, really. It's hard to make plans at the moment. Um, I definitely want to do a little bit more coaching, so I'll keep I'll keep doing a little bit more of that. But um, yeah, I would say fingers in different pies at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty exciting stuff you got going, anyway. So yeah, try and see. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Last question I'd like to um, finish with is through all your experience and knowledge that you've gained on you know from junior career to senior career so far. What advice um, can you give to a junior wanting to pursue squash as their main sport? I would say the f- the first thing is to to really be to be open about about the like the learning process. So there isn't one there isn't one way that fits every single player. Um, I think the the art of being is actually knowing how to adapt your coaching sort of style to to suit different personalities and different players. Um, you know, you obviously did develop a, a basic technique which you, you hope works. But if you watch any of the Egyptians play, like all the top Egyptians, they all have different styles. It's beautiful to watch. You know, like whether you watch Raneem, Shabini, Ali Farag, Tarek Moment, Shabagi, like they, they're all hit the ball differently. Like straight away, the way they swing it, you can see the. There's a, a clear difference. The way you can see it automatically. They've not all been coached the same way. Um, so, so as a junior, I would say like take in different opinions, you know, like have your coach and listen to what they say, but at the same time, don't be afraid to try new things or experiment with, with different ways of playing or different shots and don't be scared to just hit length all day. Um, you know, try it. If, if you, if you want to hit a cross court drop, if you want to play a little bit more attacking, like try it in a match. Don't, don't be afraid. Don't be that sort of scared thing and worry about the winning and losing as much as trying to develop your game. It's an e- it's easier said than done because as a junior and as a kid, you look at ranking lists and you look at, did I beat them or did I beat them? But if you can look, look a little bit further than that and try and develop your game in a, in a positive way, and don't worry necessarily about the winning and losing in certain situations and think, oh, actually, for like five rallies there, I played such good squash. I lost the match, but those five rallies, if I can replicate that, I'm actually going to improve and get way, way higher than, than that. So it's just, I guess, opening your mind a little bit, um, making sure you enjoy the training, because if you don't vary and enjoy the training, then you won't 
you know you won't improve because to really improve that's you know that's that's where the training comes in um and the variation of training and how you enjoy what you're doing on the court or off the court um make makes a big difference and made a big difference for me i enjoy my training when i'm competitive so whether i if i'm doing a circuit i'll i'll set myself a, a challenge and i'll and i'll time myself and i'll do the same one and i'll try and beat it and for me that's enjoyable training because i'm challenging myself to try and do something i'm not just going reading a piece of paper that has a list of 10 exercises on and just going through and doing it because for me that becomes monotonous so i would say don't be afraid to try and challenge yourself and if you're doing solos on court put a target down try and try and really get the most out of yourself in concentration wise and if you're trying to beat 10 targets in a row on a four-hand drive whatever it might be like really time yourself and see if you can beat it and for me everyone learns differently but but that's that's the way i always did it and i enjoyed my you know to enjoy your training like that i think um yeah two two important things because the enjoyment factor of it is is a major part of it and if you want to become a pro like training is a big part of it and if you're not enjoying the training then you're not improving i don't think yeah cool some great advice there um, have no fear, enjoy your training and uh, be open-minded. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thanks. Thanks for your time today, Daryl. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we can help one junior at a time that listens to these interviews. Yeah. I wish you the best of luck and hope all the, you know, any juniors that watch this, all the best and, and good luck with your squash. Perfect. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks for your time. <laughs>